Good morning. Uh, my name is Warren Limmer. I'm the chairman of the, sentence, the Senate Judiciary and Criminal Justice uh, Committee. Uh, as you know, the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission is going to be meeting this afternoon, uh, possibly to make a decision on a major proposal change. The proposal in front of that sentence, Sentencing Guidelines Commission allows criminals who have already been given a break for probation instead of prison time, even less incentive to follow the rules or follow the law. By their own estimates, the Sentencing Guidelines Commission says they will this decision will result in 536 criminals being released from prison. We have, this is all done with a backdrop of a time when we have record-setting violent crime in the metropolitan area. It's hitting our suburbs as well, and the last thing we need to do right now is to have lighter punishments for criminals. The Sentencing Guidelines Commi Commission is representative of a DFL Democrat agenda to put criminals before victims. We're very concerned about this radical ideology. Earlier last year, the Sentencing Guidelines Commission passed a provision capping probation at a mere five years, nearly across the board for every criminal sanction. This session, we will stand up for victims. This, we will also, we will focus on a strong support for law enforcement. We will examine existing laws for loopholes and sentences that don't make sense or that allow criminals just a slap on the wrist, such as for carjacking and robbery. We will shed light on the decisions by county attorneys and judges who make deliberate choices to release known violent repeat offenders and putting, them at, and putting the public at risk when they are not prosecuted. We will look at ways to rein in the appointees of Governor Waltz by changing how much discretion they really should have in the role of the Sentences, Sentencing Guidelines Commission. In conclusion, we pass laws in the legislature that are meant to be followed, to meant, meant to be uphold, upheld, uh, not just by citizens, but by the criminal justice officials that the governor appoints. We expect laws to be properly administrated by those very same people. I'm making a plea to the Sentencing Guidelines Commission and to Governor Waltz, who is the person who appointed most of those members on that commission. Put victims and law-abiding citizens first, Governor. Do not remove the enhanced penalty for committing a crime while on probation. If not, innocent citizens will be victimized, property loss will rise, and it's very likely that some of our innocent citizens will be killed. I'm going to move this on to uh, Representative New, and we'll uh, proceed with our press conference. Representative. Thank you, Senator. <clears throat> I'm Representative Ann New Brindley. I serve as the deputy leader in the for the House Republicans. And obviously, we are here today to uh, preview the vote that's going to take place this afternoon with the Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission that would reduce sentences for repeat criminals. And I want to emphasize that. This is on repeat offenders. Today's vote is about whether Gov Governor Walz's commission and appointees are going to listen to the voices of Minnesotans, Minnesota law enforcement, and the Minnesota legal community, or if they're going to listen to fringe Democrat activists. All three of Minnesota's largest law enforcement organizations oppose this, all three of them. The commission member representing county attorneys also opposes this. The commission, this is shocking, the commission received what is to believe to be the largest ever um, number of public comments ever received in state history. 
Uh, that number is 3,562 comments that have been submitted to the commission. Of those 3,562 public comments, a whopping 3,353 Minnesotans oppose this. 95% of the folks who took the time to comment on this are in opposition. A mere 209 or 5% are in favor of this proposal. And frankly, the most baffling thing about this is that no one is asking for the commission to do this. No one voted for this. No one ran for office saying, vote for me and I will reduce sentences on repeat offenders. It's just not the case. We just ended literally one of the most violent years on record in Minnesota, particularly for Minneapolis and St. Paul. Minneapolis and St. Paul set records for murders. They had double-digit, triple-digit increases in carjackings and other violent crimes. Violent crimes. And as I said in my comments a month ago, Minnesotans are tired we are tired of a culture that seems to tell the rest of us law-abiding citizens that we just have to accept the crime, that it's happening everywhere, so you need to get over it. Uh, Minnesotans are tired of having to look over their shoulder while they're parking their car at the grocery store, or worse yet, while they're bringing their groceries into the house in their own garage. They are tired of worrying about whether or not their kids are safe walking to the neighbor's house. They are tired of seeing on the news that a criminal with a lengthy rap sheet and history is let out with a slap on the wrist, only to commit another crime, which we are seeing over and over and over again right now. If the Walls administration wants to reduce sentences for criminals, they should propose a bill and bring it to the legislature. That is an open and transparent process. They should ask the Democrats in the House to go on record and vote for it. Don't try this backdoor sneaking it through with unelected, unaccountable uh, appointees from the governor. So again, today is about who will Governor Walz's appointees listen to? Will they listen to Minnesotans? The 3,353 Minnesotans who oppose this? Or are they going to listen to fringe activists? My message to the commission today is to wake up. <laughs> listen to the voices of Minnesotans. You are supposed to be representing. You are supposed to be representing these Minnesotans. This is not the time for this. Vote this down today and don't ever bring it up again. And with that, I will turn the time over to Representative Johnson. Good morning, Representative Brian Johnson, GOP lead in the House Public Safety Committee. It's unfortunately that we have to be here today. Right now, crime is out of control in our largest cities, Minneapolis and St. Paul. This proposal will reduce the sentences for repeat offenders criminals, compounding the crime problem. For those of you, don't, of you who do not know, a first-time burglar does not go into the Department of Corrections. Might spend some local time. It takes three to six burglary convictions, usually, before you go into the Department of Corrections system. This proposal will never put them into the Department of Corrections, even if they have 25, 30 burglary convictions. This is a serious issue. It's a dangerous issue for the citizens of Minnesota. That's why the law enforcement leaders across the state, including the Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association, Minnesota Sheriff's Association, MPPOA, which is the largest organization of on-the-line law enforcement officers, oppose this. The Minnesota County Attorneys Association opposes this. Clearly, the men and women on the front lines keeping Minnesota's, Minnesotans safe do not want this. They know that it's dangerous and it's gonna create more victims of serious violent crime. Now, I urge the Sentencing Guidelines Commission to vote against this proposal. 
and put the safety of the citizens of Minnesota first. Governor Walz, the people on this commission are your voice. You appointed them to represent you and the policies of your administration. I ask you to call and urge the Sentencing Guidelines Commission to vote this proposal down or just completely take it off the table and throw it in the garbage can. I ask you, how does this proposal affect the safety of every Minnesotan and the victims of crime? This proposal does nothing for the victims of violent crime or protect the citizens of Minnesota from violent crimes. The Minnesota, the citizens of Minnesota outside Hennepin and Ramsey County definitely do not want this failed, want the failed policies put in place by the city councils of Minneapolis and St. Paul and County Attorney Choi and County Attorney Freeman forced upon them. The numbers speak for themselves. There are 3,562 public comments received by the, by the Sentencing Guidelines Commission. As far as we know, that's the largest amount ever received by any commission across the state. There were only 209 comments in favor of it mostly from the Twin Cities area, Minneapolis and St. Paul. 3,353 comments from across the state were against it, 95%. The vast majority of the comments did come from greater Minnesota, who have seen the failing policies of Minneapolis, St. Paul, County Attorney Choi and County Attorney Freeman. In fact, it's even affected my community. We've had over 60 children shot just in Minneapolis. And it's repeat, usually it's repeat offenders that are doing the shooting. There was a 17-year-old boy in my community, lived one mile from my house. He's one of the unsolved homicides in Minneapolis. The Inger family are just furious nothing is being done. The policies that have been put forward over the last few years have decimated our law enforcement community and made it worse. And this, is, this policy is going to just compound that issue. Thank you. We'll open it up for questions. Anyone? Over the past few years, uh, I and uh, Representative Cornish introduced legislation, uh, a variety of pieces of legislation. We did consider abolishing the Sentencing Guidelines Commission. Uh, we uh, made a proposal to have members be confirmed by the Senate if they're going to expand their power uh, to make policy decisions we should have a little greater scrutiny in who is on that board. So a confirmation process was proposed as well. And will you be proposing that again? Uh, we, will, we will be uh, proposing that again. And I'm looking forward to attracting both Republican and Democrat uh, support for that bill. Do you have Democrat support? It's, it's way too early to do that. Uh, you know, we're a couple weeks out from legislative session. I'll be pursuing DFL support. Uh, I would imagine with the backdrop of a rising violent crime and a agency that has the authority to alter criminal sentences, that they too would want to make sure that uh, they would be in support of such a bill. You know, criminal justice issues should not be political. And we're beginning to see that it is becoming political and it's a uh, uh, process that panders to specific uh, agendas uh, that have been around na nationally for quite a few years. Well, uh, I think they're going to realize that governors change 
political parties from time to time. And uh, they could be criticizing the very appointees that we are concerned about this very year. And I think they would begin to realize, I hope they realize that political winds change in Minnesota. And they could be suffering from the very same concerns that we are. Well, I want to make sure our state reps get in, into this too, but right now, uh, yeah, we have been talking with uh, police officials uh, throughout Minnesota, both uh, urban and uh, outstate law enforcement agencies. They're very concerned about the safety of their personnel. They're concerned about retention. They're concerned about recruiting. And in the current environment, when, when they see prosecutors especially in the metropolitan area, not prosecuting the very laws that the legislature has put into the books and signed by governors, making it a legitimate state statute, they're very concerned about the safety of their citizens as well. Uh, right now, I'm not prepared to give the details of our agenda uh, prior to the start of the legislative session. We do plan on making that available in the next, well, within the next time remaining before we start our session. But I'll, I'll ask if state reps want to uh, answer the same question. Uh, we have a number of <clears throat> proposals. Uh, we are not going to be discussing or releasing them now. We will be doing that uh, in, a, in a week or two, putting out our agenda, putting the issues that uh, are concerning to us. We have talked to the uh, number of groups, including the Chiefs of the Police, uh, the Sheriff's Association, MPPOA, the County Attorneys Association, and looking at their concerns. Uh, so we, we will be doing that uh, probably in a week, week and a half. Let me just add one thing. Uh, you know, Mary, you asked the question of why would uh, the House give more power of confirmation to the Senate. Um, and, and it goes beyond that. Unfortunately, our Democrat colleagues have shown that uh, their positions on public safety will follow politics. Uh, that is not our position. We believe that public safety is a critical function of government, uh, regardless of what the politics look like on any given day. But because things have gotten so bad, even our Democrat colleagues in the House are now talking about public safety. And we're seeing that, you know, they haven't said exactly what that looks like, but even they, it has gotten so bad that even our Democrat colleagues in the House are talking about public safety at this point. And again, it's unfortunate that that is a political calculation for them, but we believe that public safety should matter every day, and we're willing to pursue that. So speaking to politics, is public safety Republicans' top issue in the campaign, and do you think it's your best issue? Um, I, I would say this is not uh, having nothing to do with the campaign. Public safety is the top issue for Minnesotans right now. Public safety, and, it's, and public safety is the top issue for Minnesotans right now because again, we just ended a year of record crime in the state of Minnesota. Minneapolis and St. Paul set record numbers for murder for people having been killed in our state. So having nothing to do with campaigns, public safety is what Minnesotans care about. And frankly, it is objectively one of the most critical issues facing our state right now. But you are on the ballot and you want to take the House back. Well, certainly we will be talking to Minnesotans about what they care about. Fortunately for us as Republicans, we align with that issue. We believe that public safety is critical for our state and a core function of government. Senator Limmer, are you on the ballot for sure? Uh, am I on the ballot? I'm yeah. not quite sure yeah. what you mean. Are you mean running by that. for sure? Are you I am running. For I am running for re-election. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I want to add one comment uh, to Representative News. Um, the very first article in our state constitution justifies the purpose of government, and if you read it carefully, it simply says the protection of the citizens is the number one priority. Article 1, Section 1 of our state constitution, 
makes that abundantly clear. And the question when I see 50% of all crime coming out of one county, Hennepin County in our state, they generate 50% and you have a prosecutor that won't prosecute his definition of low level crime, there is something seriously wrong going on in our state and in Hennepin County. We as a state government cannot allow that. We cannot ignore that, that uh, that failure of that office. Uh, we've even begun to ask questions. Well, if they're gonna cut back on 50% of their, of their prosecutions, do they need as big a budget as they claim they have now? There's lots of questions to be asked about this, but more importantly, the, the role of this government is the safety of its citizens. And if you have a rising level of crime, violent crime in the state of Minnesota, Anywhere in the state, we have to match it. We have to face it down. We cannot have thugs, rapists, robbers, carjackers to continue doing what they're doing un unimpeded. The party's over, and we have to move on it. I have two questions, actually a two-part question. These are sentencing guidelines, so judges could go outside of the guidelines if necessary. And if the commission does go ahead and approve this change, would you be proposing um, legislation then to undo it or, or find some other way to, to put your, your preferred sentencing in place in law? About 40 years ago, the legislature in their infinite wisdom allowed the Sentencing Guidelines Commission to alter sentences that we have created in law. Uh, as a result, this commission is, is attempting to take advantage of that authority. We simply believe this is not the right time to do it, number one, nor maybe ever. That decision of existing state law was passed through a representative branch of government. Remember, that's, that's the one where the public has their voice in government, and they're changing that. How do we get around this? We would have to basically repeal, through statute, we would have to repeal the decision of the Sentencing Guidelines Commission and then have a governor sign that. We believe that the moment right now, the most influential person in the state of Minnesota is Governor Waltz to speak directly to his appointees and tell them to stand down on this decision. I, I would add to that. I would flip that question on its head just a little bit. You know, in the last legislative session, the legislature actually um, passed legislation to increase penalties. And, and now we've got this unelected, appointed board who is using their authority to undo what the legislature did. Uh, and, so, and so we now need to look at whatever recourse we have to make sure that doesn't happen. One, one other item, uh, one other item is, is as the sentencing guidelines, they use a grid uh, to determine the sentences that we have. It's placed in it for severity and also a recognition of criminal history. This particular proposal ignores that criminal history of a criminal while in probation committing a crime. So as that is taken out of the grid, it causes a ripple effect up and down the sentencing grid. And that could, that results in those 536 prisoners being released uh, immediately. Uh, did you have a comment? Representative Navati. Thank you. Uh, it, it, to your question about is going, something going to be done about the sentencing guidelines, we do have a, a bill uh, that I will be dropping that will uh, amend the way judges can do sentencing guidelines uh, disparities if they can do a, a, an upward departure or downward departure and how that's handled and monitoring of that. And I, there's a couple of points I want to get to. Uh, first of all, uh, I think it was Mary, you had the question about this being a cog, uh, an election year. Our, our position hasn't changed in the two years since I've been here. Last summer, if you remember, we stood in the, the rotunda and pleaded with uh, the 
the Democrats and the governor to give us emergency funding. That was in June. We predicted then that the summer crime wave would hit and we wanted funding for extra people and extra money for the air wing that would hopefully interrupt some of this crime and we were ignored. Um, we were not on the election or any ballots in then and our, our stance has not changed. I spent 33 years standing up for victims. I will continue to do that. Do I have concern for the the, the people that commit these crimes and, and do we want to see them get in a point that they are in a better life so they're not committing these crimes and violently assaulting people? Yes, but our first, our first dedication and the thing we should worry about is the victim and the survivors. Specifically why we're here today is this overwhelming trend of extra legislative ways of the governor's office getting away, getting around legislative functions. We've seen the same thing with the citizen advisory board to the, to the post board, uh, where they're proposing changes and they must be heard by the full post board. We've seen that in all these commissions and councils that we're, we're doing right now before session starts. And that's how this started, to st the whole drop the point for custody status started. They say well, they're gonna do one thing. They do, uh, once you get the commission started, they do a whole different mission. And it's, that seems to be the playbook of, of getting around legislation and the two party system in the, in the house. Is there a lawsuit then? Is this a constitutional question or a legal question if an unappointed board isn't following the law? Has anyone thought of that remedy? Well, I, I won't speak to how it, the negotiations are done, but in, in my view, it's um, there's a proposal for something that sounds really good and something that people want to work with and they want to change. And once the once the council is started, you find out the real mission, and it's a, you know it's a lost leader. It's a it's a misguided. It's a a, a sleight of hand trick. That's what I've seen as the pattern of all these commissions and and the appointments. But if you can't address it legislatively, would somebody address it in the courts? I can understand it. Would uh, we address it in the courts? The uh, question of whether or not it's constitutional or not, I don't know. Uh, however, the most immediate process would be to get the legislature to be convinced that the direction that the Sensing Guidelines Commission may be going in would be inappropriate for this time. And uh, our work will be to see if we can get the House to uh, join us. Uh, it'll be interesting if they want to do that or not. Uh, uh, you know, as we all know, the DFL control the majority in the House, and they may be reluctant to countering uh, the actions of the governor's appointees. So uh, whether or not there's a legal challenge somewhere in the future, uh, I guess that remains to be seen. Uh, there could be a question about that. Uh, I never thought of it prior to this point, to your question, so I can't answer it. Uh, maybe in a couple of days I can give you a little better idea. I think we're, you can we're probably going to have to get down to the last question. Yeah, I was going to say, Senator, yeah. so can I ask... Do you all, especially the Senate, do you all regret any of the legislation passed in the past couple of years on policing or criminal justice reform? There was changes to no-knock warrants, changes to the police use of deadly force statute, um, changes, I believe, to some, like the sign and release warrant um, measure, I believe, passed. Do, is any of that, do you have any regrets? Are you looking to overturn that? Like, what's your kind of feeling on some of that that was passed in the last couple of years? No, I don't have any regrets, uh, with the exception of perhaps uh, we were uh, concerned about the use of deadly force, but the courts have made their decision on it, claiming that it was unconstitutional. Uh, it kind of um, reinforced my suspicion on it, but nevertheless, it was part of a negotiated settlement. Uh, I believe that when we put together omnibus, omnibus bills regarding criminal justice and law enforcement combined, uh, one should move slowly one should uh, create a balanced bill. Balance is very important for the courts to understand. 
and put lots of legislative intent into our public record. Uh, we don't want judges to uh, take advantage of a uh, uh, ambiguous uh, law that didn't have any underpinnings of debate. Uh, we want to make sure of that. Getting down to your last question, no, I don't regret doing what we did. I think we have balanced bills. And keep in mind, government never goes away. Uh, we're all coming back this, this uh, January and February and uh, going at it again. We're, that's where the living documentation of our law is in our statutes. What does going slow look like to you this year with a lot of the stuff you're considering? Do you think the same principle applies? Is there just like a process you could walk us through for, for going slowly and considering some of this? Well, there always should be a process, and it should always be transparent. And the sooner we get back to public meetings, the better. Uh, that's not my decision to make, and I don't want to go in that direction. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we'll be right back at it. We'll be making our proposals. Uh, again, I think I can speak on behalf of the people in this room. Public safety is our priority. And we're going to support the public in being as safe as they can. And that means we have to hold other county officials, prosecutors, and maybe even judges accountable to the decisions that they're making that create a hazard for the public. And saying that, uh, I think we'll conclude this press conference. Okay. Oh, just one uh, quick comment. On Minnesota, and I want to remind the Sentencing Guidelines Commission this, Minnesota has one of the lowest incarceration rates in the country. We bounce back between 48th and 49th. Our, we do not put many people in prison. And we also had uh, last year Commissioner Schnell trying to change from 66% time down to 50% time. These proposals to keep, not put people that are violent criminals in prison is not going to make Minnesota safer. And the people in 85 of the 87 counties across the state have made that message known. Thank you. Thank you guys.